And here's the experience on the island. Verse 2 says, And the barbarous people, or the islanders as some translations say, showed us no little kindness, which means they were very kind. That they were extremely welcoming and concerning and openly embracing them as they came onto the island. We see that because they built a fire for them. They kindled a fire and received every one of us because of the present rain and because of the cold. I want to help you today to make sense of Malta. Malta is this place that you probably never expected to find yourself in. And that's my first point this morning. Is Malta is a place you never planned on visiting. Let's think about Paul here for just a moment. He's here. He's in prison for doing nothing more but sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's simply doing what God has told him to do, and he's found himself here in prison in this place called Crete. And now he's being transported to Rome to stand before Caesar for the ultimate sentencing. He knows he's got a big job ahead of him, and he's on this boat. They've taken off, set the sail. Things are starting to look really bad, but an angel came to him, come to him and he said, Don't worry about this, Paul, because you must stand before Caesar. He knew where God was taking him. So why in the world would he end up on Malta? Maybe you have a vision in your life as to where you're headed. You had this picture of retirement. You had this picture of a career. You had this picture of a perfect marriage or a certain relationship or just you within yourself as to where you're trying to go in life. So why in the world do we end up on Malta so often throughout our journey? I want to help you this morning to make sense of Malta. Paul here has found himself crashed on this tiny little place here called Malta. He's freezing to death. He's shivering in cold. He's in an unfamiliar place in an unfamiliar language. He's not really certain what's going to happen. Have you ever been to Malta this morning? That's the place you never expected on ending up. But most of the time, isn't that life? Aren't we always in a place we never intended on ending up in to begin with? See, Malta is that place when you're 28 and single. Amen. Malta is that place when you're in your 50s and going through a divorce. Malta is in that place where you thought you had this picture of where you're headed and all of a sudden your health starts failing. Malta is that place that is crippling you in your life and you just can't make any sense of Malta. So I want to help you this morning to how to make sense of Malta. We see here, he's shivering in cold. He's stranded on an island. He has no idea... What's going on? He doesn't understand the language. He doesn't understand the culture. But we see in verse number 3 that he's still trying to be helpful. He's still trying to make the best of the situation that he's found himself in. He's sitting here and he says, Okay, well, I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm not really sure what to make of all this. But I'm going to try to make myself useful. He's been revealed as a pastor. The people know that he's a preacher. And he's sitting here and he doesn't want to look like he's a helpless preacher. They can't do anything. So he goes over and he tries to pick up some wood. And he's trying to help the situation. And it says, when Paul gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. So here he is. He goes over and he picks up a bundle of sticks, right? He goes in here and he's carried it over. And, ah! He's got this viper. This is Gary, by the way. He's got this viper stuck on his hand. It fastens to his hand. It's, it's not coming off. This wasn't some quick little snake bite. This thing fastens. To his hand, the Bible says. It fastened on his hand. He's putting the wood there in the fire. The heat comes up. And this viper takes hold of anything that he could. And here he is. He's got this snake on his hand. Now, Malta is a place you never planned on visiting, right? But Malta is also the process you never planned on going through. Paul's just trying to get to where God's trying to take him. And here he is with a snake on his hand. He's been in prison for sharing the gospel. He's being shipwrecked on an island against sound advice. He's like, guys, you shouldn't do this. I know this is going to end badly. 
and he's still, he finds himself shipwrecked, but now on an island, things are looking up for him, amen, but it seems like everything that's happening to him keeps coming and coming, and even when things start to look good, all of a sudden, here he is with a snake fastened to his hand. Have you ever been to Malta, Amen. Where it seems like things might be turning around, and then all the, I mean, this is almost comical. I mean, everything in the world keeps happening to this poor, poor fella, and he's standing there, like I'm standing here with a snake on his hand. I mean, he's sitting there, it's a viper, and it's connected to his hand. Now, third thing is Malta are those people that you never planned on having to deal with. Here, these islanders, barbarians as it says in the King James, were trying to be helpful to him. I want you to think about this. They're trying to be helpful to Paul in, in warming him, and then Paul's trying to be helpful in return, and then all of a sudden here he's got a snake on his hand, and no one comes in to try to help him out. Look at the next verse. Verse number 4, When the barbarians saw the venomous beast hanging on his hand, they began to make judgment. They began to make excuses and give reasons as to why he is going through what he's going through. Have you ever been to Malta? Amen. No doubt this man is a murderer. He's just trying to help get the fire going and all of a sudden they're labeling him as a murderer. Have you ever been labeled for something that you weren't really guilty of? But that might have been the way it appeared at the time. It says this man is a murderer who though he has escaped the sea... Yet vengeance suffereth him not to live. He's saying, we know this guy came out of the sea. God didn't kill him there. But now look at him. He must have done something wrong. Have you ever been to Malta where you're facing just one more thing, one thing after another keeps coming to you and people are like, uh-huh, you're going through what you're going through because of this. You know, if you, if you weren't such a lousy parent, your kids would have turned out better. If you weren't such a sorry spouse, your marriage would be even better. If you weren't this, then things would be a different way. Have you ever been to Malta? Amen? Malta is those people you never really planned on having to deal with. But they're there. Paul is standing here. I mean, they're sitting here casting judgment. This poor guy's got a snake on his hand. And they didn't bring him an ice pack or an aspirin. They're just sitting here passing judgment on this guy. Well, this guy must have done something wrong. God must be really upset with him. And this has come with a connotation in this culture of the world back to the story of Jonah and how Jonah had judgment passed upon him. And that's why he was cast into the sea. And the, the whale came and spit him up on the island. And they knew this story. They were aware of this story. They believed in other gods, but they knew the story. And they're like, yeah, this is another Jonah we got on our hands. He's just some guilty slacker who's sitting here getting himself into more and more and more trouble. And verse number 5 is the turning point for this story. This is where we start to make sense of Malta. Paul's had all these things happen to him. He's, he's got a snake fastened to his hand. I mean, it was there for a while. It wasn't just some little quick thing that was over. He's sitting there, and they're watching him. They're staring at him. And he's sitting there. He knows he's got a captive audience, amen? He knows they're watching him. They're expecting to see his response. And I'll tell you, one of the most important things we need to take from this is our response to the situation we get, on, we get in. You know, he's sitting here, he knew he had a captive audience, he knew I, all eyes were on him, and let's look and see what he did, because he preaches one of the greatest sermons ever in the New Testament. Now I'm going to read verse number 5 from the, the TSV, the Taylor Swift version here for a minute. And he looks at him and he says, alright, I see y'all looking at me, and he looks at him and he says, players going to play, play, Play y'all, y'all join along with me here. Haters gonna hate, hate, hate. Yes, hate five times. Hate, hate. He's sitting there looking. He's like, you know, heartbreakers going on. We we'll have to go through the whole thing. We get the point. He's sitting there saying, "Yeah, you're judging me, but I wonder what's going on with you." In reality, he didn't even say a word. This was the greatest thing he ever could have done. He looked at the crowd. The crowd was looking at him. He had a snake on his hand, and it says that he shook it off. Into the fire. Scare people after this. 
he shook the beast off. You just got to shake it off. And that's what we got to learn to do as Christians when things come against us, when people start scrutinizing and criticizing and looking at, down their noses at us. We got to learn to shake it off. Amen. We don't need to go to Facebook and write a response. We don't need to get all bent out of shape and start talking back to people and getting in arguments. We just got to shake it off. I want you to look at your neighbor right now and say, shake it off. Shake it off. Amen. Shake it off. He shook off the beast into the fire, and he felt no harm. Nothing happened to him. God was certainly with this man, even though everyone had turned against him. Amen? Have you ever been to Malta, is my point. Here, this tiny little place, on a grander journey for God's ultimate destination for him, which was to help someone who was a leader of the world. Why in the world would all these things happen to him? Why Malta? Why the snake? Why all of these things? Because God had a bigger purpose in mind. And that's the fourth thing this morning. Malta is that place you never planned on visiting. It's the process you never planned on going through. It's the people that you never really wanted to deal with. But what we need to see is in verses 6 to 10, and that is the purpose for which all these things have taken place. The Bible says, How be it, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds. That's why you cannot put your faith in people. They will change their mind on you like they change underwear, as people say. They'll change their mind on you in a heartbeat. One minute, he's a murderer. The next minute, we see it says that they looked at him and they said he wasn't God. One minute, he's a murderer. The next minute, he's a God. One minute, they yell, Hosanna. The next, crucify him. Amen? We cannot put our faith in the response of others. And I talked about this in the message a few weeks ago. That many people get so caught up in the reason why they're going through what they're going through that they never get to the revelation that God is going to bless it and use something and do something through it anyway. And he didn't get all caught up in the reason as to why all this was happening for him. He understood that God needed him there for a specific reason, for a specific purpose. And the revelation is found in verses 7 to 10. In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days. Here they are looking at Paul, expecting him to fall over dead. Aren't you glad that people are watching you and you're not falling under the pressure? Amen? That's one of the biggest things I want you to take from this today, is many people need to see Jesus in you more than they need to hear it from your mouth. They need to see it. And Paul didn't talk junk back to them. He just shook that snake off. And he stood there. And the people still expected him to fall over dead. And when they saw that he didn't scroll up and die, they were like, wow, this guy must be a God. And while he wasn't a God, God was certainly with him. And we need to take that very seriously. Because there was a man, a very important man here, he was going to a very important man in Rome named Caesar. But instead, God directed him to another important man. Maybe not as equally important, but in this island's culture, very important. And his name was Publius. Why did God take him to Publius? Not because of what Publius and his people were going to do for Paul and those shipwreck survivors, but because of what we see in verse number 8. The purpose that all this has happened. Here's how he makes sense of Malta. It came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and saw him sitting there. This is Publius' dad. He's got the Malta fever, and he's got dysentery, and he's going to die as far as they know. And they roll him into the room, and Publius is sitting there. They've got this big feast going on, and they've got this big banquet prepared, and Paul's like, 
who's this coming in here? And Publius is explaining the backstory, I'm sure, and says, well, this is my dad, and he's got this Malta fever disease thing going on, and we're expecting him to die at any point in time. I have a feeling it's about at this moment that Paul probably started nodding his head and smiling really big, saying, okay, now this makes sense. I'm now making sense of Malta. I now have these people on my side because they see God in me and they see that God is with me. And they don't believe in this God that I'm serving and living my life for day by day. And now all of a sudden, this is really going to get them and show them how big God really is. Have you ever been to Malta? Amen. Because this is exactly where Paul found himself. And notice the same hand that's probably still swollen a few days later where that snake latched on with that same hand that was bitten by the snake. He heals this man through the power of God. And a revival breaks out here on this island called Malta. It says that he prayed, he laid his hands on him, and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. There are people all over this community of Bristol who are dying of a disease called sin. And if we could show them how big God is in our moments, in our situations, in our Maltas right now, they would all come flooding to Woodlawn Baptist Church to be healed. From this thing that they're suffering from that was started so many thousands of years ago. Publius was just trying to put on a party, but he had a problem. His problem was his father was dying, but then his father was healed, and then this party turned into a church service. And what started off as a reason for Paul a while back that turned into a revelation to him that God is going to do something amazing regardless of the circumstances, that revelation led to revival. In the month of October, I'm going to be talking about revival. And I want us to understand that revival is going to begin in us. It's not going to be through a speaker that comes to the church. It's not going to be done through a pep rally. It's not even going to be done through my preaching. It's going to be done through God's people. Revival has to begin with us. When we see God doing something and we show others that God is so great and He is so awesome, revival is going to break out and things are going to change for the better. We see that all the people came out and He had to turn His house into a church. And verse number 10 says that they also honored us with many honors. They were so thankful. I wonder how many people look at this church with squinty eyes and with, you know, a, uh, a suspicious grin will be changed and say, wow, God is amazing and He's real and it's because of those people that I'm watching expecting to fall over dead, swallow up from the snake bite called sin, amen. I'm expecting that to happen any day. But when we just stand there and let God be God, and demonstrate God through our lives. We're going to change the lives of the people around this church. Amen? Amen. That's how we make sense of Malta. Why haven't we grown any more than we have? Well, maybe we're waiting on the right circumstances for the right event and for us to receive the revelation. Stop getting so caught up in the reasons of why everything is the way it is and understand the revelation that it can be a whole lot better and God's going to do it through us. When we get to that point, that's when revival, Amen? is going to break out. That is how we make sense of Malta. Let's all stand as we close in a word of prayer.